Brunswick's Bill 17 has passed third reading in the Legislative Assembly and became law on December 13th. The Higgs government's legislation effectively forces thousands of unionized public sector workers into so-called shared risk pensions away from their current defined benefit plans, which provide a minimum guaranteed level of benefits for workers on retirement. The new law affects workers such as school custodians, bus drivers, and educational assistants, along with nursing home workers, among others. Union members in the public gallery heckled government MLAs as they voted for the bill on third reading on December 12th. Mr. Ames, Ms. Ames, Mr. Ames, Mr. Turner, Ms. Bonders, Ms. Union leaders and opposition MLAs have called the bill an attack on the free collective bargaining rights enshrined in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Instead of focusing his efforts on getting his government in order and working on behalf of the people of New Brunswick, he is turning his attention to a personal vendetta against working people using legislation to override freely negotiated collective agreements of workers across the province. The member for Freddington South and leader of his party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand today to table the names of 1,175 New Brunswickers who have signed a petition requesting that the Premier withdraw Bill 17 and instead honour the collective agreement signed between the Government of New Brunswick and education and nursing home workers. In total, workers from across New Brunswick collected over 5,000 signatures in just two hours on Saturday afternoon, showing just how opposed to this bill New Brunswickers are. Mr. Speaker, over the weekend, my colleagues and I heard from hundreds of New Brunswickers, actually thousands of New Brunswickers, and we can see that here today because we have a gallery full of people from the firefighters union, the teachers union, the nurses union, the bakery, confectionery, tobacco and grain milling union, obviously the school bus drivers, the nursing home workers are all here because they are deeply concerned about their future and about their pension. Premier Blaine Higgs has argued that the current plans are unsustainable. Forward to have a sustainable pass on a pension program, have a future in the pension that was uh, one that was balanced, was fair to taxpayers, fair to employees, and that was our goal. And that's what we agreed to in an MOU, Mr. Speaker, to spend one year getting progress and having a path forward. So, Mr. Speaker, at the end of that, there was an extension, another three months, and then another three months. And, Mr. Speaker, no progress of any kind. And in fact, our legal folks say, you know, there, there's, there's nothing to arbitrate, there's nothing to go forward with because there has been zero progress. So, Mr. Speaker, but critics argue that the government has systematically underfunded workers' pensions to create the appearance of a crisis in the system. Well, this is shock doctrine stuff, right? That's exactly it. Like, you, you know, create the problem yourself to get, uh, you know, to make the politics around getting your preferred solution supposedly easier. But, I, you know, I think the public, I think, is pretty well aware of, uh, you know, that this is a government-created problem. For more on this and on other labor issues, the NB Media Co-op spoke to Danny Legier, president of the NB Federation of Labor. I started off by asking him about the significance of Bill 17. Well, certainly on the pension issue, the, the best pension a worker can have is a defined benefit pension plan because he knows exactly what he's going to get when he retires. Uh, back in 2013, there was a conversion of Part 1 of the public service into um, these uh, deferred risk pension plans. Uh, however, the defined benefit plan is, is by far the, uh, the superior plan from a worker perspective. Now, under a defined benefit pension plan, the employer, uh, whoever that might be, uh, shares the responsibility or, or has the responsibility of backstop of the pension plan. Uh, and, and from time to time has to make special contributions. Uh, where under the, uh, de the deferred risk, the, uh, the, the responsibility or the, 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 the folks that might end up with the short string, unfortunately, are the workers or the pensioners. Uh, the significance of, of this piece of legislation is that, uh, unlike in the past where the plans were legislative plans, they weren't negotiated plans, 
in this case, these pension plans are negotiated uh, through the collective bargaining process. Uh, they're in the collective agreements. And from an organized labor perspective, the biggest concern around Bill 17, uh, beyond the, uh, the, the pension question, is the uh, legislative inf interference with uh, the, le the free collective bargaining process. Uh, let's make no mistakes about it. What Bill 17 is, is a ta an attack on signed uh, uh, collective agreements and the rights to free collectively bargain. What it is, is, is the government giving them, by way of legislation, the authority to break signed collective agreements. Uh, now, we haven't really seen anything like this since uh, 1991, when uh, Premier Frank McKenna uh, broke uh, signed uh, collective agreements with the uh, with the workers of the province. I'd like to add the share risk pension plan or deferred risk pension plan uh, is a tool in the toolbox. It isn't uh, necessarily something that uh, workplaces should never entertain. In some cases, uh, pension plans are in a position where uh, they're fa they're possibly facing a plan wrap up. Uh, in which cases uh, the shared risk plan uh, uh, would be a viable alternative. Like on the scale of pensions, uh, the defined benefit by by far is, is the best uh, a worker can have. And probably at the, the bottom end of the pension scale would be uh, an RSP. The shared risk finds itself somewhere in between those two. So um, it, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world that uh, no one should ever entertain but it's just that it's a tool in the toolbox and certainly the the shortcomings uh, that the Higgs government is trying to address and enforcing uh, workers and, and breaking signed collective agreements to put them into a shared risk pension plan is wrong at this at this stage the NB media co-op has obtained a copy of a memo from the government from the Deputy Minister of the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development uh, to education workers warning them against uh, illegal strike activity, uh, saying that, um, that they may face discipline up to including termination as well as fines under the Public Service Labor Relations Act. Uh, any comment on this kind of memo going out to, to workers at this time? Well, absolutely. I mean, it, it's kind of sad when you think uh, these workers who worked uh, – through the COVID pandemic, who uh, are there showing up to work every day to serve the people of New Brunswick because they are public sector workers who are facilitating the education of our children uh, to when um, government uh, or certainly Premier Higgs and his conservatives uh, want to ram through this legislation that they threaten, bully and intimidate workers with these kind of letters. However, uh, never do these workers ever receive a letter saying, you're doing a good job, keep up the good work, we appreciate you. Uh, it's, uh, you almost wonder, uh, you know, where where uh, the real priorities or the mindset of this government is when it comes to, to workers and certainly organized labor. What are the next steps for the labor movement if and when Bill 17, which is expected to be passed into law before the Christmas break, uh, does indeed uh, go forward uh, with Royal Ascent. Yeah, well, certainly QP is is the union that represents the workers immediately affected. Uh, we are there to support uh, and help QP, uh, uh, but they 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 they're the lead on this file at this point. Uh, but certainly the entire labor movement is watching this closely, both the private and public sector uh, unions, because. Um, the nursing home workers are actually covered by the Industrial Act and, and are, are, are private sector uh, um, entities. So it's the first time in a long time or possibly uh, ever that uh, governments have used their legislative powers uh, to affect the terms and conditions of work for workers in the private sector. So we'll follow CUPE's lead. CUPE will... Uh, will um, uh, strategize around that uh, and we'll be uh, certainly offering any assistance that we can with them along the way. Uh, you know, one of the things is the Minister of Labor uh, made very, uh, in my opinion, derogatory, derogatory comments towards the leadership of CUPE in the legislature, all the while toting herself as a, 
as a, a trade unionist, and uh, you know that she certainly didn't uh, didn't and doesn't reflect trade union on union principles. And I can only speak to my own experience as somebody who ran a union for 25 years. I went through the same experience. I went through the same experience. I was asked by the employers to convert to a shared risk plan. It was a tough situation all the way around. And I can tell you this. I can tell you this. One of the things that I did for my membership, because I'm not a pension expert, union leaders are not pension experts. They're not paid to be pension experts. Pension analysts are. So in my particular case, what I did, none of the members liked it. But we were at a crossroads. I was getting nowhere in negotiations because I had a plan that was underfunded. And I had to figure out a solution moving forward. I could not unilaterally make the decision. I had to go to the membership and say, listen, how are we going to fix this? What are we going to do together? I don't like it. I don't like it. You don't like it. But what are we going to do to try to move forward? So we actually we brought in pension analysts. And those pension analysts, we gave the membership the opportunity to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one because every single person's situation is different. And I can give you a few examples. Somebody who just joined the union who was 25 years of age, young family, said, what's this going to mean for me? I didn't have that answer because I was not a pension expert. Somebody 65 years old who went on the tools probably for 40 years, had already raised their family, their wife had died, they were now raising their grandchildren, would say to me, what's this going to mean for me? Can I even retire now? Members, if you'd like to go to your anti-room, Sergeant, please clean, clean the gallery. Like I said, private sector and public sector unions are, are, um, are watching this closely, or are vehemently opposed to this type of uh, legislative interference. But also across the country, folks are paying attention, and they realize what's at stake here. Uh, you know, what's next? This time, uh, the government is using it to, uh, the conservative government to, is using it to attack uh, workers' pensions, uh, but once they've used it once, what's to stop them for using it for anything that they might want to? I, I want to ask you now about uh, the two coroners' inquests into workplace deaths uh, that uh, have been t taking place this week. William Russell and Daniel Moore both killed on the job. Uh, any comment on that? Absolutely, David. Uh, you know, any any death is one death too many. Um, out of these recommendations, there always comes um, recommendations. Uh, from time to time, there's uh, employers are held accountable, and I think in all cases, employers should be held accountable because every workplace accident is preventable. So there'll be recommendations come out of these two inquests, and uh, uh, hopefully they'll be acted on, and, and the, the recommended changes uh, to WorkSafe will be implemented. And of course, earlier this year, uh, in September, a uh, supervisor on a construction site, Jason King, um, was sentenced in a wrongful death uh, of 18-year-old Michael Henderson, one of, the, one of the workers at that job site. Uh, thoughts on this case? Well, of course, the labor movement followed that case uh, quite closely. It went through the, uh, the court of King's bench, um, justice... Um, Jeez, Justice Christie uh, heard the case and, and gave what I thought was a, a balanced uh, uh, and fair sentence uh, to uh, Mr. King. Uh, the young worker, just 18 years old, out of high school, uh, looking for a career in uh, in uh, the construction industry. Uh, Michael Henderson was his name. Was the tra tragic uh, victim, and uh, Mr. King was found criminally responsible for the for the death of uh, of Michael Henderson. And uh, I think it's important, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that employers and supervisors be held accountable when they are found responsible for the death of a worker. Danny, before we wrap up, uh, anything to add about any activities that the federation has underway right now? Well, of course, besides uh, trying to stay on top of uh, the, the activities around Bill uh, 17, uh, uh, one of the things we have on our radar is we're organizing for the first time a youth summit. Historically, the Federation of Labor 
had a, a, your, a, a youth uh, summer camp, week-long camp, the long weekend of August. Uh, but um, since the pandemic, it's been harder and harder to uh, to get interest from youth to give up a week of their long weekend in August and, and come to a week-long uh, camp where we have fun activities and uh, also a big part of the camp, of course, is education, things like health and safety and how to stay safe at work. Uh, you know, tragically, too often, young workers are the ones who are the victims of workplace accidents, and, but other, other, other topics as well. Uh, so what we we're doing, we've shifted gears. We're trying something new. We're calling it a youth summit, the Blair Doucette Youth Summit. And uh, because Blair was the uh, past president of the Federation of Labor who started the, 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 uh, the week-long youth, uh, youth uh, week. Uh, so uh, this year it'll be at Broad, uh, broad, is it broad Leaf, I think. Is broad Leaf, yeah. Broadleaf uh, in Alma, uh, kind of a retreat type of a environment for youth, a lot of outdoor activities um, and uh, some, uh, some valuable ec uh, educational components to it because these are high school uh, age youth uh, and uh, are on the verge of entering the workforce. Well, it sounds like a uh, fun and educational opportunity. And where can people learn more if they would like to get involved? Well, in order to participate, uh, you have to be a child of a member of an affiliated uh, union of the Federation of Labor. And uh, actually, uh, after this interview, we're finalizing our poster to send out, and uh, we'll be sending it out to all of our affiliates to uh, to uh, see if there's any youth interested in this uh, fun-filled educational weekend uh, in the 1st of May. The city of Miramichi says it's reviewing its protocol on the raising of flags in a local park after peace activists flew the flag of Palestine. A group called the Chief for Peace raised the flag on December 2nd for the civilians and especially the children killed in Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip. The event featured members of area Mi'kmaq communities who spoke out against colonialism and performed ceremonial singing and drumming. They also invoke the phrase, every child matters. That phrase is often used to honor the indigenous people who were forced into the residential school system here in Canada. But at the recent event in Miramichi, that phrase also referenced the thousands of children reportedly killed in the ongoing war. The Gaza Strip has been under bombardment from Israel since October 7th, when Hamas fighters attacked nearby Israeli military bases and towns. By December 11th, the death toll in Gaza had surpassed 18,000, including more than 7,700 children, while Israel's official death toll stood at approximately 1,150 civilians, according to the latest figures published by Al Jazeera. Despite bad weather, more than 150 people assembled at Queen Elizabeth Park, according to the Chief for Peace to find a little bit of bravery and courage and sure enough it's not for myself or for you but for particularly the children of Gaza we have to speak and while I recognize this moment is symbolic it's what we have we have the people we have the love and only God knows what comes of it but we come together in opposition to this war machine. And I think they're about to find out what they're up against. We're not calling for violence and we're not calling for revenge, but our strength is greater. While the activists called for peace, some local residents saw the Palestinian flag as an indication of support for Hamas, according to the city of Miramichi. In fact, the Palestinian flag represents the Palestinian National Authority, not Hamas. The Palestinian flag has been flown at the United Nations headquarters in New York since 2015. Hamas, the militant Islamist group that has controlled the Gaza Strip since 2007, has a separate flag. The city acknowledged in a statement 
that the Palestinian flag isn't formally affiliated with Hamas, but said that it has been interpreted by many to indeed be an indication of support for them. The statement said in part, we wish to clarify and confirm the city of Miramichi does not in any way endorse this organization, meaning Hamas, or the acts of terrorism they have perpetrated. The intention in this case was to show support for Palestinians, innocent victims, and their loved ones. We share the same support for the innocent Israeli victims and all innocent victims of terror and war. The mayor of Miramichi, Adam Lorden, wasn't available for an interview. A spokesperson said city councillors will review the flag-raising policy in the new year. Well, for more on this story, the NB Media Co-op spoke to Niger Saravia. He's a member of the Chief for Peace, the group that organized the demonstration. Yes, on December the 2nd, uh, uh, more than 150 people gathered from the community. And we had people coming from uh, other cities as well. And uh, because we were the second city in Canada to raise uh, the Palestinian flag. So we went through the, through the uh, protocols, normal channels. We applied for the, uh, for the, in the city of Miramichi to raise the flag. And we were honored by the uh, Mi'kmaq chief uh, in the daily community in raising the flag. And one thing that was really amazing is that more than 25 kids came and they were enjoying and they were learning about this experience that other kids are going through in, in Gaza. So we raised the, we raised the flag and, and, and we acknowledge the suffering and we honor all the victims that are taking, all, we honor all the victims in Palestine. So the main idea was to, uh, first of all, to show solidarity with, uh, with people of Palestine. Second is to uh, get the community involved and to learn about what's going on in Gaza. Because the media is telling us, the regular uh, media is telling is telling the population, is misinforming the population about what's going on in, in Palestine. What was your reaction when you learned that the town had taken down the flag? You know, it's, it's, it's pretty upset uh, that we got a pushback from a few uh, uh, citizens, Miramichi citizens, that they... Uh, they were not happy with the with the raising uh, the Palestinian flag, and uh, so but we're still we're still finding out what was the reason behind that. And uh, unfortunately, the flag only were uh, was uh, was up for two days, and and it was taken down because of there is a pushback. We know that the the there there is a lot of misinformation, and and people are, you know, extremist people are taking this opportunity to harass politicians who are being, who are being supportive of, uh, of calling for a ceasefire, who are harassing us, uh, citizens who are calling for a ceasefire. So we know that, that these people are pushing back in Miramichi as well. The town of Miramichi said in a statement that uh, its staff originally believed the town's flag protocol would allow for the Palestinian flag to be flown as it was meant to commemorate the innocent civilians, including children killed in the war. Uh, this is from a statement from the town of Miramichi um, on, on uh, their Twitter account. But since then, the town has heard from citizens, it said, who, this is a quote, provided insightful perspectives that while the flag was not formally affiliated with Hamas, it is being interpreted by many to indeed be an indication of support for them. Again, that's a quote from the town of Miramichi. Uh, your response to that, uh, Niger? Yeah, there is a, a, a narrative uh, around the world that is pushing people to believe that the Palestinian flag has something to do with with Hamas. The Palestinian flag is a, is is represents a country. It does not represent a political party. It does not represent uh, uh, mil a military group. It does not represent any any uh, religious group. It represents the people of Palestine. That's all for today's show. Thanks for joining the MB Media Co-op today. I'm David Gordon-Koch.